In this video, where I have a cold and a sore throat, I'm going to tell you about why I think there's so many board games out there these days with miniatures in them. Just a starting note, I'm going to try my darndest to not sniffle and snort and leak during this video, but you may want to turn on closed captioning and down the volume. You know, it depends on what your threshold for ick is. So I've talked about gateway games a number of times on this channel, if you want to watch one of those. Pachow. But gateway games, very quickly, are games that kind of bridge the gap between, let's say, board games and tabletop wargaming miniatures, or maybe RPGs and tabletop wargaming miniatures. And it brings people from there, hopefully some of them, over to our side. But if you've been paying attention to the gaming news, um, just information from different big publishers and things like that, or the Kickstarters that have been coming fast and furious over the last several years in the tabletop area, you've maybe noticed a bunch of games that you might think, well, are those gateway games? Right up front, not every board game that has miniatures in it is a gateway game. A gateway game allows the player to understand the concept sometimes of line of sight, uh, cover a little bit, range, um, directionality, depending on the game, all kinds of things like that. And like I said, there's a lot of them out there. But there's also these days more and more big board games, big expensive box games that come with a ton, especially if you get in on the Kickstarter and the, you know, the stretch goals really start to add up, they will come with a ton of plastic. And I've had people ask me, they're like, well, so would this be a good game to be like to get my friends into Wargaming because it's got all these miniatures. And a lot of times you have to sit down and look at the map, look at the board, look at the rules, and that can help you kind of make the differentiation yourself. Here's kind of an easy one. Axis and Allies is not a miniatures game. It's a board game. But it has miniature boats, miniature soldiers, miniature tanks, and stuff like that in there. But they're basically just fancier markers to show that you're moving tanks from France to Germany or whatever. And it's usually these types of games, and a lot of them are from companies like Cool Mini or Not and stuff like that. It's a big map, which I believe sometimes in in board gaming parlance is called area control, where you're controlling a country or a region. Those little plastic Vikings or tanks or space people or whatever are just a marker to say we're moving a certain amount of Vikings from Sweden to Norway. And that's just so you can keep track of it on the board. And sometimes they're even bigger and you have really fancy looking ones. But for the most part, the, the plastic models that come with your average board game these days, your big ones, Scythe, uh, like I said, Blood Rain, Rising Sun, a lot of those types of games, they're not of the same quality that you and I are used to from playing tabletop wargaming miniatures stuff. Generally, the plastic is softer, so if the model has some sort of sword, it's frequently a little bendy, or maybe the detail is not as high. Some, type, some people will say that the detail is softer, um, so they're a little bit smoother and you don't have as much sharp detail as you would like in a really nice hard plastic um, model. Now, one of the reasons for this is because generally hard plastic models come on a sprue and you have to put them together. If you've played pretty much almost any, say, Games Workshop big box board game like Space Hulk or the new Blackstone Fortress or stuff like that, you still have to build those models. In many of the new board games that are coming out that come with tons and tons of miniatures, they are of a softer plastic and they've been sculpted in a way so that they can be basically kind of stamped out and pop out and not need to be built, which for most board gamers is a benefit. These usually come in some sort of colored plastic so that you can differentiate sides or factions or whatever, and they're not painted. If you asked probably all of the board gamers out there who play these types of games, if you asked them, would you prefer if these models were pre-painted when you bought them in the box? Probably 90 to 95% of them would say, yes, I would prefer that. Because most of them are not going to actually sit down and paint these models. If it was a board game where there's maybe six or eight different figures in there and that was pretty much it, then you might have a chance. Um, but with the amount of models that come in a lot of these big box games now, especially because of the Kickstarters and all the add-ons, most of these models are never going to get painted. Now this could be a good benefit for you, the either beginning painter who's looking to find more pieces to practice on. So you talk to your friend and say, hey, look, I'll paint this whole 
board game for you and I'll do it kind of quick, but it'll look better than just the bare plastic and the different colors and stuff like that. And they'll be like, yeah, that's cool. Or maybe, you know, they're going to pay you or they're going to work on your car or there's some sort of barter or whatever the deal is going to happen. But it gives you the ability to work on these models, kind of crank through them sort of quick, even if it's just the very simple kind of like some washes, some detail, a little bit of dry brushing. Sam, one of the, his first video he ever did on this channel was, t- was painting um, Zombicide models. Now those, Zombicide, in my opinion, is an actual gateway game. But the process for painting the models quickly is pretty much the same. Pachow, that's a good one. You should check it out, especially if you have a lot of board game models to paint. Your other option is that you could actually start up a little side business and talk to people at your local store who have bought these big box games and now would like to get them painted. Maybe you don't know them, so it's not a barter thing like you got with your friend, but maybe it's something you do and you go, look, I can, you know, you know how many models are in Blood Rage and then you can just straight up say, it's going to cost this much for me to paint your Blood Rage. But the main question you have to ask yourself really is, well, why now are so many of these board games including all of these models. I mean, really, when board games first came out, it was a lot of cardboard little chips and, and that you moved around on a, on a map, and, and that was all you needed. And let's be perfectly honest, you could play Malifaux, you could play Warhammer, you could play any miniature game with a bunch of different painted pennies and maybe some cardboard boxes for vehicles, um, and that would work. You could do it. Obviously, it's not as enjoyable. So partially, I think, with board gaming now, there is a more of a spectacle, more of a visual enjoyment on seeing all these three-dimensional, especially colored plastic, brightly colored different figures on the, the, the tabletop, on your, on your actual board game board. And if you get somebody to paint them, or if you paint them yourself or something like that, then that even increases it more. So that kind of stuff really helps to trigger people's kind of lizard brain and get them a little bit more interested in a board game that maybe they wouldn't be as interested in if it was just cardboard chips and... Uh, and maybe some dice. The other big deal, of course, though, is that the manufacturing, especially in this type of slightly softer plastic, uh, you know, for these, these miniatures, that type of manufacturing has gotten greatly cheaper than it used to be. And like I said before, many of these different shapes can still be kind of dynamically kind of posed, but yet still be a one piece model. So you don't have to as the person who buys it, put everything together before you can even start to play. One of the big benefits to board gaming in most situations is that you open up the box, you take out all the parts, maybe you have to punch out some cardboard chips here and there for tokens and things like that. You read the rules and you start playing. As you and I know, as war gamers, we've got a little bit more work ahead of us before we can actually start rolling dice. So to answer a question that I get pretty frequently about uh, is this a new kind of era of board games that are not gateway games that come with tons and tons and tons of miniatures. Is this bad for wargaming? Is this bad for miniatures? I would say no, it is certainly not. Now, is it good? Is it beneficial? Well, maybe a little bit, because maybe if you are playing what is just a straight up board game, I am moving Vikings to France or whatever, you're not worried about range and, and cover and stuff like that. It's just a placeholder still playing with these cool plastic miniatures, even though they may have a bendy sword and not very highly detailed uh, chain mail or whatever, can still, I think, get some people, not everybody, but get some people interested a little bit more in the actual idea of playing with miniatures. And they may just start painting the miniatures that they have in their board games and and loving to do that. And that may be where it stops. And that's great too. Don't get me wrong. Because still, even just painting these big box games is still got all of the meditative, stress relieving, other kind of benefits that I think that tabletop painting and sitting there in your basement or wherever your hobby room is can give you. Um, But maybe, just maybe, it's going to get some of these people to start looking towards the gateway games And then after that, who knows, maybe we end up with a few more board gamers in our midst.